professionalizing social work was actually created by me um, and uh, Sam and a couple of others who were frustrated with national and honestly with just all the racism, white supremacy and all the ridiculous stuff that goes on um, within the social work profession. So the space was created to listen, engage, hear and take action and do what our title is, revolutionize social work. And honestly, this movement has grown to a contact list of over 9,000 social workers globally, which is amazing. Um, and we started with the history of racism and white supremacy, and now we're on to racism and white supremacy in clinical practice for social work. Um, and some other items I want to mention that have come up in our past town halls, and the link will be put in the chat. Um, for anyone interest, interested in the formation of a peer support group, um, you can click on the link that will be provided in the chat. For anyone interested in contributing to a revolutionized social work action group, um, also follow that link and you will be uh, directed to a form or you can fill that out. This is only for BIPOC leaders only. If you are white or identify as white, this is not for you. This is only for our BIPOC social work leaders. Um, and social workers with white privilege will be encouraged to be team members at a later time. And if anyone is interested in changing the leadership at New York State. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, oh, sorry. So for, I would just kindly ask everyone to mute for now. Um, and so any. Oh, sorry, I was muted. So for anyone interested um, in changing the leadership at NASW, please do nominate a social worker who you think will be good for a will give a good direction for New York State. Um, some Zoom etiquette things to go over. Uh, for closed captioning, you can click on live transcript below. Um, please be muted um, until we open up the space for everyone to share, use reactions. It's a really great place to show support. Raise your hand if you do wanna speak. And I really wanna emphasize this, the purpose of tonight is to amplify and uplift BIPOC voices. This means if you are a social worker with white privilege, you can engage in the chat and use reactions, but mostly actively listen to the members who speak today. This is not your time to speak. This is time for BIPOC social workers. And that's really important to remember. Um, and if you are a non-white social worker, of course, you are invited to engage and lead the conversation tonight. If you would like to speak and reply to a prompt from our facilitators, we ask that you use unmute and use the raise your hand function and you will be called on. Thank you. That was a lot. So I hope everyone was able to process. Thank you so much, Notion. And again, welcome everyone. My name is Sam Fletcher and I am the executive director of the New York State chapter of NASW. Um, I ask you to continue putting where you're from in our chat feature. We'd love to go through and see where you're joining us from and who you are. So thank you for doing that. Um, the first thing I wanna do tonight is thank uh, our revolution leadership team. We will have their pictures and their bios up on our website shortly. We have a long list, list for our website, so we, we're working on a lot of web pages at once. But um, our la at our last meeting, you met Caroline and you met Cecily, and you just met Notion, who's part of our leadership team. And you're also going to meet Don, Afsha, and uh, Devin tonight, who are also members of our leadership team. Um, they are the ones who lead this initiative, who really decide what we're doing next. And I, of course, I have to thank Evelyn Williams, who's our policy coordinator, who leads us all and really helps direct us all in, in what we're doing and how to be the most effective in what we're doing. So I want to thank you all for that. Um, so again, I want to just mention that uh, we'll continue putting links in the chat. If you're interested in volunteering, we are moving into the work group phase for schools of social work. And we're meeting with any BIPOC person who's interested in leading a work group. We're meeting on March 8th for a training. And um, Amelia put the link, she'll continue putting it in there. So let us know if you wanna come and be a leader in our work groups. Uh, we look forward to meeting you. So tonight, um, the leadership team, the last time we met, they asked me to identify myself um, because uh, there were some comments last time about um, a, a white person talking at the beginning of the, the meeting. 
and they got a, a little defensive of me. I actually identify as native, but I have full white privilege. It's important that I say that part because no one got on tonight and said, oh, what tribe is she from? Um, I'm actually a member of the Cherokee Nation and of the Bird Clan. And so the leadership team wanted me to make sure I told you that tonight. Um, for one reason, it's because our chapter is led by native culture and native culture is much different than Western culture. The leadership style is completely different. Um, it's not really hierarchical, it's leaderful with each person doing what is their strength. Uh, if you were gonna think of it as hierarchical, you'd think of it as an inverted triangle to where that I am here to serve you and I'm here to serve our members and I'm here to serve social workers. That's my role in this and you're here to lead. So um, that is the way the chapters ran and they thought it was important I tell you that. And I'm gonna tell you a couple of other things about native culture. Um, one of them is the way we view the world. Like if we think about culture of what we are, how we are and who we are, one of the how we are's, the way we walk through the world is what we seek and we seek peace uh, in my culture. So I am constantly seeking being at a place of peace. Now, don't confuse peace with good emotions <laughs> because a lot of times in seeking that peace, there's a lot of negative things that come with that. So for example, my anti-racism work that I've been doing for years, there's a lot of negative pushback on that as with anyone who does anti-racism work, but this brings peace to me. So of course I do it. And that is, you know, I promised you since the beginning that we will continue doing this work until there is change because that is the goal is to change the profession of social work. So that's just one of the things from our culture. Other things that I wanted to say is that, you know, for people with white privilege and for, uh, we have white people who've joined us since the beginning of this um, and they come every time and they join us. I was actually watching a documentary this week and I had this revelation and it was about privilege and how when you do this work and you've lived in, in privilege in your skin your whole life, it's uncomfortable. People get really uncomfortable doing this work. And if you're gonna to continue to do anti-racism work, that means you're gonna stay uncomfortable. And I think that can be very difficult for people who've lived in comfort because your, your inclination is to get to comfort as quickly as you can. So, you know, maybe you might talk to other white people and be like, but you know, this really isn't me. I'm not perpetuating racism to try to make yourself you know, feel better about it and everything. And I think to truly do this work and grasp this work, you have to commit to being uncomfortable because when your eyes are open to racism and how it exists in every part of our society, then you're gonna notice it everywhere. And I hope that you seek peace. And I hope that that peace leads you to being uncomfortable and speaking out and working toward change. And the last thing that I'm gonna end with is a land acknowledgement, because I know that um, this is kind of a new thing for me, for people doing land acknowledgements, but this is, this is a common thing now for people to do land acknowledgements. And I wanna to talk to you about that from a native perspective. So the land that I'm currently on was originally held by the Iroquois, the Mohawk and the Mohicans. Um, but we don't talk about land. In, in my culture, you don't own land. You can't own land. Um, land is a living being and our relationship with land is a lot different. So we view land as the land feeds us, it nurtures us, we, we grow food on there, that's what provides us our food. The land also protects us by sheltering us uh, and, and offering fences when needed. And the land also heals us, it heals us through herbs and it also heals us through its beauty. And so when I want you to think about when you're doing your land acknowledgements that now you're the guardian of land that was taken from native people and how are you gonna be a guardian of that land? And how are you gonna care for that land and respect the land? Um, because it's very important to our people and you have to understand what that means for tribes that were displaced. My tribe was in the mountains and in the forests before we were taken to Oklahoma. 
as were many tribes. There's a lot of tribes that were displaced to Oklahoma. And Oklahoma is a very flat land. It doesn't have natural water. It doesn't have mountains. It doesn't have a lot of forests. So that, that's part of what heals us is being out on the water, being in the mountains, being in the nature. So you really have to think about what that did to native people to be taken away from the land that we love. And wherever, whatever land you're on now, whoever it belonged to, I just ask you to be good guardians of the land and think about the land like native people if you're doing land acknowledgements. So thank you. And I'm gonna hand it over now to our wonderful facilitators. Thank you, Sam, so much for that and Notion for your introduction. Um, I am going to kick us off. My name is Devin Beswick, and I will be one of your co-facilitators for tonight. Um, just to kind of, you know, create some ground rules for, or just uh, a baseline of how things are going to go this evening, how we hope things are going to go. I'm just going to reiterate some of what Notion said, which was that uh, this space is specifically for BIPOC participants to share their stories. Uh, we ask that our white allies just kind of listen, observe, um, hear and understand what we're saying and where we're coming from. And for our BIPOC participants, uh, please hold space for each other. Um, I know that this is a very heavy topic. It can be a very heavy topic. We have all endured some possibly traumatic experiences um, throughout our careers, academically and both professionally. And so with that being said, I also want to encourage everyone to um, take care of themselves however you need to, um, whether that is during this call afterwards, um, please do so. There are a number of resources for BIPOC individuals. Uh, we will share them in the chat for anyone who needs them. Um, uh, the NASW New York State chapter will add that into the chat. So you guys will have some resources to go through. Um, and yeah, please, Audrey Lord once said like, Self-care is not an act of um, self-indulgence, it's an act of self-preservation. And this work is, it requires self-preservation. Uh, it is ongoing, it is uh, strenuous, and we need to kind of take care of ourselves in order to sustain this movement. And so please, please do so, take care of yourselves. And um, I'm looking forward to our discussion tonight. Afsha. Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Afsha. I am going to be one of your co-facilitators tonight with Devin and Dawn. Um, and I just um, kind of want to repeat and echo everything that Devin and Notion have said. Um, and also um, just, you know, when we're talking about our experiences and sharing our experiences, um, we just want to reiterate the importance of confidentiality um, and to not um, share names of agencies, supervisors, colleagues, and our clients for the protection of both ourselves and um, your own selves and each other. Um, so um, let's just be cognizant of that. Um, and I'll introduce it on to Don now. Thank you, Afsha. Good evening, everybody. My name is Dawn Knight Thomas. Thank you all for being here tonight. Um, what we're doing is changing up um, what we're gonna do initially. We're going to have um, some students from Columbia University speak and just inform us about something that's going on with the professor there. Um, and then we'll come back together and we have questions that you'll answer and we'll continue the format as we usually do. And so tonight we have Natasha and Maryam who will be just informing us about what's going on at Columbia University um, with Professor Erica Hart, who's an adjunct professor there. And uh, what we may be able to do is there may be some similar things happening at the universities that you're attending now or that you have attended in the past. So we can um, speak about that as well. But at this time, just have Tasha and Marianne speak first. Thank you so much for being here. Thank you for having us. Um, thank you for that introduction, Dawn, and hello, everybody. Um, like uh, Dawn said, my name is Natasha. Um, Miriam and I are current students at the School of Social Work. Um, 
and we're in our final year. We are also leaders in the school's Action for Black Lab, uh, Action for Black Lives initiative um, and the Action Lab for Social Justice. Currently, we are on strike. And we are on strike um, because last Wednesday, a adjunct professor named Erica Hart, um, who was just absolutely amazing and admired and adored, um, revealed that she was pushed out of the school um, by deans and upper administrators. She stated that um, she, you know, had a student and the student was very anti-Black and very transphobic towards her. Um, and, you know, when she tried to report the student, she faced backlash. When she tried to um, report the administrators who she faced backlash from, she was essentially told that um, the issue was handled and that they weren't going to discuss it again. And she was not asked to, uh, to teach the following year. I'm going to uh, put in the chat a link to our um, Action for Black Lives statement, which includes um, links to her tweets and links to uh, her Medium post, so you can read them yourself um, and have the information in her own words. Um, while I'll do that, Miriam, can you take over? Yeah. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for having me. Um, before we even get into this, I really want us to feel like emotions. So I think that if we can use the chat and how many of you guys are just tired, just tired of having to prove your worth, like you can just type yes, tired, very exhausted. And as we watch the chat blow up, because now it's blowing up and I'm like, whoa, I wasn't ready for this, um, but it's going to continue to blow up. Right. That's how I'm feeling today. I'm feeling exhausted. Um, I'm not exhausted because I'm black, but exhausted to constantly having to prove myself. Um, and I think when we step out of this situation and we step out of student versus professor, um, we start to look at the systemic, systemic issues that are at hand. Um, being black, I, I wanna say now that this experience has proven that being black is, it's in fact being disposable. Um, growing up, I always heard hey, go to school, get these degrees, and you're going to be respected, you're going to be protected. But I realized with this situation that even if I get these great, great degrees and this certificate and this doctor in front of my name, I will always be disposable. And I'll always be Black than my qualifications, um, which is why we took this situation so personal. It wasn't about just Erica and the student, um, because I will say we have not heard from the student or we don't even know who the student is. We just know that harm was done. Harm was done from what Erica felt and harm was done with how the school responded to her. Um, and when we take another step back of it, the response from the Dean, something that was said was she respectfully disagrees with Erica's experience. Erica's trauma was respectfully disagreed with. Um, and this has been our trauma, right? As Black students in this school, and I think Black people in general, BIPOC folks, um, when we go into these fields, whenever it's our trauma, we have to give, we have to give information, right? Like, if I go to someone and I say, hey, trauma was perpetrated on me. How? Why? What happened? What did you do? Right? Um, and I see so much of myself in Erica. And as I look on the screen, I've been scrolling past. Each and every one of us have been Erica Hart somehow, some way, right? Each of us have been silenced by an institution or by a job that we're taking on, um, but we're there because we want to make impact. Um, and earlier you guys said something about self-care and I was just like, wow, self-care, like how does self-care look like being BIPOC? What is self-care? Are you even granted to self-care? Natasha and I have been on calls for seven days straight. Absolutely. With, with no break, with no self-care. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge people's um, people's story, right? Like our stories are silenced by these laws. Our stories are silenced by policies. Our stories are silenced by the white faculty members in our groups. Um, and the non-Black POC ones as well, because, you know, anti-Black racism is per perpetuated by everyone, right? Um, 
I'm, I'm, I'm just so tired of what's happening. Like Miriam said, we've been working hours on Zoom calls, writing things. We're exhausted, but we're not going to stop because we don't want what happened to Professor Hart, what happens to us every day, what happens to, you know, other Black professors and administrators, other Black students, we're tired. We are surviving and we're not thriving and it's not fair. It's ridiculous. And the institution continues to perpetuate anti-Black racism. The institution is, is, was founded in white supremacy. Historically, it just was. That's what it's built off of, you know? And it seems like, you know, with Columbia, they say they're dedicated to, you know, fighting against anti-Black racism and they're, you know, dedicated to not only making statements, but taking action. What actions are being taken? We know what student actions are happening, but what actions are being taken by administration that are helping, that are, you know, where's the accountability? I think throughout all of this and throughout all of my time here, there have been no accountability mechanisms um, in place. When racism is perpetuated, you know, students can keep on going, professors can keep on going. It doesn't seem like people care about our experiences enough to actually do something to help us. And I think like, even with us, what we've been discussing is reimagining life in general um, throughout the lens of like white supremacy. Um, I think we've normalized these experiences where we just are walking through life like, oh, trauma, 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 another one, another one, just keep on going. Um, and it's as early on as I believe some of us work with children. I know I'm a full-time teacher. Um, and I ask myself so many times the beliefs or my core beliefs that I had, where do they stem from? Um, and I think it starts within us, right? Tackling our own beliefs and then um, taking it from there. But with Erica Hart in general, I think so much of what we've heard is I don't have enough information to believe. I don't have enough information to put my own, um, my own personal support for her. Um, and I think that's something that as this group, as you guys are, keep on growing, we have to lean on each other, right? White folks should use their privilege. Um, but as BIPOC, we need to like really have these conversations, these very conversations that we stare away from, right? Like my experience is just my experience. Maybe Notion is not dealing with it. Maybe Natasha's not dealing with it, but we all deal with it somehow, some way. But when we start to like normalize our own silence, um, what do we expect from our white folks? They can't do much, right? Like it's about speaking out, calling out these institutions, calling out these jobs, calling out people that you see who are perpetrating white supremacy, even if they are people of color. Um, and as a student, like we've seen what collective power we have. Um, we've seen how coming together and sharing this and saying that, hey, like I'm not going to be silenced. I stand fully behind um, Erica Hart has made impact. Um, and that's what I have to share for now. I want to add in that um, a group of students have come together in uh, advocacy and in protest. Um, I'm going to link our list of demands in the chat. Um, if you guys feel comfortable enough, feel free to sign on. As of now, we have over a thousand signatures. Um, and uh, yeah, we've just really come together. If you um, are on social media, on social media, hashtag ActNowCSSW um, is uh, something you can search. Um, Action for Black Lives is um, created an amplifying Black CSSW page where Black uh, community members of CSSW can anonymous, anonymously share their stories. Um, so you can follow us on Instagram. Um, yeah, you know, thank you for having us. And um, we're hoping, we know that what we're doing right now will create change. In fact, you know, the Dean sent out an, an email today in which uh, she apologized to Erica. I don't personally think it was substantial. She doesn't really say what she's apologizing for. 
And I think, you know, for a proper apology, you need to state what you're apologizing for. You need to, you know, take accountability and you need to provide reparations. And also I wanted to just backpedal on that as well. It's not in your head. I just really want to leave that. Sometimes we think that these things are in our head. It's not in your head. Um, but I also want to urge you to find your people in your job places, find your people in your schools. Um, you cannot battle this alone. Um, once you find your peoples, then it's easier to go against white supremacy because white supremacy is something that's way bigger than us. Um, but you are not alone in this. I'm pretty sure the black person or person of color across the street feels the same way. And dismantling the system takes work, it's exhausting. And I have felt guilty for saying I'm exhausted, but that's just the truth of the matter. And white folks, um, I've heard you guys say that you guys are exhausted, but just know that that BIPOC person of your coworker or your student or your neighbor feels exhausted 365 days, no breaks at all. Um, so I urge white folks to use their privilege to speak out. Um, tackle your own core beliefs as well. What were you raised in? What were you raised to believe in? And then the work starts there. Also wanna echo what Sam said, be uncomfortable because when you're uncomfortable, you're one step ahead of doing the work. Thank you both so much. And you are part of the warriors that we have today. And yesterday I went to um, hear someone speak and she called, she said something that was really powerful to me. What are you being, what's being called of us today? So what's being called of you today is to make that change along with other Columbia University students as well and other allies that you will get. Because the, as you fight and move forward, that's how change will happen. That's just how change will happen. So thank you so much for taking this up, for being the warriors that are needed at this time at Columbia University. And um, people can sign um, if they're in agreement to sign off on the form that you left in the chat. And um, we'll send you some positive energy because it's not easy work, it's hard work. And it's, a, I say, a soulful tiredness. It's not just being your regular tired. You're talking about a soulful tiredness that every day, the things that have to be confronted. It's like you're going shopping, you just want to get bread and you're being followed in the store. You're just going to work, just doing your regular thing. And you have to deal with anti-Black racism. Someone says something or does something. So yes, my sister, you are tired, but hang in there. And we're sending you positive vibes just to encourage you, to lift you up. Um, those who can sign off on that form so we can support you in that way. And thank you so much for coming today and letting us know what's going on at Columbia. You're not alone. And so I don't know if um, maybe Devin, you want to meet, read the first question for this evening? Sure. Well, first, I wanted to see if we wanted to open up um, okay. a bit Thank just you. after um, what Miriam and Natasha just kind of spoke about. And if anyone has reactions or comments or um, anything, yeah, <laughs> that you would like to kind of respond, um, now would be the time to do so. I want to know why, why, why you pay for this. You know, there are options to pay to go to places that welcome you, that respect your culture, that have people who look like you, teach you. You know, uh, why, you know, why would you even want to be an alumni of an institution that has this, this, this consistent commitment to racism and prejudice? And I mean, you know, you know, there have been, you know, black people, uh, you know, have, you know, committed themselves, walked to institutions so they can get liberated. And just as black people, we have to realize our money is important and we got options. And as an, a two-time HBCU alumni who did not live in the cities that I went to school, there's no way that I would pay one dime or one dollar 
to anybody who treated me the way that you are treated. And it's the mental health issues that the stereotypes that we have in our mind that feel like graduating from these predominantly white institutions are superior. And that's what we really have to deal with. Cause I wouldn't, I wouldn't just listening to you. I wouldn't give them a quarter. I sure wouldn't take out no student loan in order to get education from a place that's just racist. It's, it's outrageous. Thank you so much, Melissa. Um, I do want to say, I, I want to respond to that. Um, part of it is because I just didn't know. I grew up saying that I grew up knowing or hearing that I needed an Ivy League degree in order to get through the door. Um, and also, I think another problem is within our communities, we don't have mentors, right? We don't have mentors who look like us that says, hey, like if I were to find you when I was in college and you can say, Miriam, go to an HBCU because you will be valued. But I didn't have that. Um, and I've been looking for black mentors for a while. I found them now, but it's, it, it's, it's something that's not there. Um, so you think go to Columbia, go to Harvard, go to Yale, because once you go in there, you're going to get through the door. You're going to get this Fortune 500 job. You're going to get this great job. It's still a struggle, right? Like as graduating students, we're looking for jobs and we're just like, wait, we're not even through the door with an Ivy League degree. And even some of my friends who's graduated from Ivy Leagues, they're working for $58,000 right now. So it's the misconception that comes with graduating from an Ivy League. We've all been there. Um, and would I do it again? Absolutely not. I sit, I have a little brother and he says, I want to go to Yale. I want to go to Columbia with you. And I'm just like, no, like your black skin matters. Go somewhere where you're celebrated. Um, and now on social media, we see HBCUs, right? But growing up, I'm 25. When HBCUs was there, I didn't know. I have immigrant family. I have immigrant parents um, who just didn't know. They just said, come to America, get a degree. And that's it. The lack of information is not there. The lack of mentorship within the Black community or BIPOC community isn't there as well. Um, because we're tired, right? Like, I know for sure that I'm about to finish this degree. I teach little kids and I'm their mentor, but I'm tired. What about me? And I can just imagine the Black folks who have made it, they're tired too. Why do I need to stretch myself thin to tell you what to do next with your career when I'm still dealing with it? And even the Black folks who are in Colombia right now that are workers, they're tired too. Well, so let me tell you, you inspired me. I'm the president of the National Association of Black Social Workers, and I'm going to have to do a better job to make sure that y'all know that y'all got options. Yeah. And Ms. Joyner, who's the president of the National Association of Social Workers, she is a Howard University alumni. She is one of, my, one of the greatest. She's out there doing great work. So there, are, NABSW is a Black organization who have chapters in New York City and in, 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 in Jersey of Black people who have been committed to liberation in the community. And I say the same thing about Dr. Joyner and, and Brother Angelo. They are doing great things. And you, you have options. And you have to always know as a social worker, you're going to work with people who you're going to help them identify options. You're going to let them know that it's okay to not support this. It's if I, I, I hire over 200 people. If you graduate from Tulane or if you graduate from Southern University, I'm paying you the same thing if you got a master's degree in social work. That's the truth. So it's important that we know and that I do a better job to let black people know that there are black people out there who are doing this work and who do not put up with this foolishness that y'all are dealing with and certainly not paying for it. So um, you've inspired me and I'm gonna make sure that we try to make more people know that options are available. Um, I was agreeing with Melissa, um, I think it's at this point, it's very, unfortunately, we have to rely on our own community to provide um, important advocacy um, because I'm actually reading a book called Racecraft and it discusses like how um, society has taken these non-scientific quotes facts and use them as um, 
they've just been perpetuated in our daily languages, behaviors, and things over the years to where we own that they're okay. So even uh, this is my last year in grad school and even two years ago, I was contemplating, well, should I go to grad school at a PWI or a HBCU because of um, the job options I would possibly have. Um, but thankfully I was around, I went to HBCU, I went to, I graduated from a &T, so I had a lot of people around me um, advocating for going to an area that I'm going to be comfortable in, that I'm going to produce my best work in, and I just know that a PWI would not have given me that, um, that support. I'm going to take it a little step further. Melissa, I appreciate your sentiments and what you're saying, but I have to mirror what Miriam said in the fact that we as a community have to do a better job with getting the word out. I am the first um, on both sides of my family to ever go to college. So to be the first to go to college, I didn't find out about an HBCU until after I graduated graduate school. So we have to do a much better job at reaching into the high schools and educating those young, young folks because education wasn't really big in my family. I just happened to like school, which was fortunate for me, but when you went into the guidance counselor's office, they didn't have any HBCU placards hanging on the wall. They had state system schools and I'm from Pennsylvania. So I looked at the state system schools, which none, well, there was one that was uh, HBCU, but I don't think we as a community do enough work reaching into the school systems to educate those kids who really don't have that push from the family to go to school, but they have that drive in, in and of themselves. So if you're not educated on it, you just don't know that it's there. And I was I sort of remiss after the fact, like, wow, I missed this great opportunity. And I have to give a shout out. I see my director's on here. She does a great job with reaching out to a, a local HBCU with fostering, getting uh, minority students into the field of social work. So we as a community have to do a much better job at reaching out and educating them on what options are out there and available to them. Thank you, Ray. Um, Sh uh, Shadima, I see your hands raised. I'm sorry if I pronounced your name wrong, um, but if you would like to speak now, you can do so. You get an A plus, you pronounce it correctly. Thank you. Um, so this has been wonderful so far. I appreciate people being brave and courageous and sharing what's going on, Miriam included. I mean, not Miriam included, especially you, Miriam. And I want you to know there's a lot of love for you in the comment section if you if they're just scrolling through. And then the other comment is to, well, a second comment is to you, Sam. I appreciate you uh, identifying yourself because um, my background just briefly, uh, I was a social, I'm a social science researcher and I went to a PWI for my bachelor's, my first master's, which was useless. Um, it got me in the door to a racist work environment. Um, where we purportedly did DEI work uh, in a research hub at that PWI that has a university-wide DEI strategic plan, go figure, right? And so I left that job to go back to school for a second master's in social work. And I just graduated in July, 2020 uh, with Devin. So shout out to Devin. Uh, that said, uh, what I will say is that I went to that institution because it was, I lived in Ann Arbor <laughs> and I went down the street, you know. Um, my parents, I am also a child of immigrants. Um, my dad got his PhD many, many years ago from U of M. And most of us went to University of Michigan. Uh, I also went back as an older student. And so I, when other black students would say, I can't believe you said that, or how do you just say what you need to say is, I have age privilege. I was just staff, right? And so I had a different experience than some of my colleagues. That said, there was a time I wanted to quit because of the racism that existed at a, that institution. And I knew that I 
for me, I chose not to quit because of so much support and love I had in my life, right? Uh, the other thing, someone else said this in the chat, a lot of black faculty, you know, and I taught, so University of Michigan paid me to get my second master's, uh, a decent amount of money. And I left with a lot of money <laughs> in my bank account from scholarships um, because I did it the right way the second time because I was wiser. And so I like the sentiment if, if not now, when, if not whom, you know, because a lot of black people, when we are in all white spaces, we're the only, right? And there's a lot of pressure being the only one. And I think about 22 year old Shadima. I'm not 22 anymore. And I think about her and I think about how I felt, how I was, I didn't feel like I was valued, right? And so many other things. And so I think sometimes we, sometimes we're stuck in a rut and stuck with where we are and where we feel comfortable. I think sometimes we don't know. Those of us that are children of immigrants, I don't wanna be broad with this. Many of us, we know certain schools and they are top tier institutions. And a lot of them are PWIs uh, because we, our parents didn't know any different. And then some of us do feel compelled or called to go back to those spaces to show up for other students who are like us. And so I do have a sense of responsibility as a black woman, I can't pull those two identities apart, to show up in a meaningful way that honors those who have gone before me and honors those that are coming behind me. And so Melissa, I so appreciate what you said because you sound like me. It's like, you know, you have unpaid me in the end, right? That said, that's not everyone's experience. And so I, I do feel for anyone who is struggling right now. I hear you, I feel you, I love you, I see you because I've been there too. And my privilege that I enjoy is to be in service of others, period. And the reason I came to social work was because I saw so many problems in social work. And I'm not gonna swear on this call because we're recorded and I choose, I choose not to do that even though I like to swear. I came to social work to shake you know what up. That is my role. And so people look at me and I'm smiling at you and dragging you at the same time. That's what I'm supposed to do, right? Because we have problems in this field and it's not, I mean, white supremacy is a major one, right? And everything, I think they're tendrils from that, right? That said, we do have other issues too. So I'm gonna focus and stay on topic and uh, pass the mic to someone else. I really appreciate you all. I have to hop off soon, but um, I'm glad this is recorded. I look forward to hearing the rest of it. And uh, everyone just you know, take a moment to think about Ahmad Arbery and the opportunities that were cut short from him a year ago today. And uh, maybe that can help or continue to fuel our fire, especially when we're exhausted because so many of us are. So I'm sending massive love to each and every one of you, especially during these difficult times. Thank you so much, Chidima. Um, I think I speak for everyone when we say that you just reached in and like touched all of our hearts with that um, statement. Um, I absolutely, you know, I absolutely adore you and you, Chidima is right. I'm not afraid to curse on this call. We did shake shit up <laughs> in grad school um, and you just can't be afraid to call things and people and institutions out who are perpetuating anti-racist or racist um, ideologies. Uh, I think this would be a good time to transition into um, our topic for this evening, which is about uh, racism within clinical social work practice. Um, so I'll go ahead and read our first question before I do that. Thank you everyone for um, commenting and sharing your experiences. Oh wait, there is a hand. Do we, Sam, yes. do you wanna? Okay, go ahead. Um, Miria, you can uh, speak now if you would like. Hi everyone, my name is, um... Maria Lupercio or Mireya Lupercio. I'm a mental health provider here in Wilmington, North Carolina. Um, and I just really wanted to just add more to what the last person um, said. You know, it as a first generation Mexican American, some, you know, that question of like, why did I go to a school that maybe didn't make me feel 
um, accepted or welcome. And I think like, I just reflect on that. And I think it just has a lot to do with what, again, I, I just didn't know any better, but also in a sense, like that feeling, I don't know anybody else feeling that way, but that feeling of like, I should be, um, I should be humbled, right? To be able to go to a college or to even be accepted to a university. Um, I did go to an undergrad or, you know, university here in Wilmington that is predominantly white. Of course, I didn't have my awakening until I was in grad school and realized, oh, dang, like I, it was actually a privilege for them to have me there. Um, instead of looking at it from the other, you know, from the lens that I was looking at when I was applying to school. But I think I just, at that moment when I was, you know, young and the first one trying to navigate in my family, what it is to go to college, um, I just didn't know. I, I, I guess I feel, I felt privileged to be able to go to university. Um, and definitely now reflecting like, gosh, now I have all these student loans to pay. Um, but I, I, I think it definitely made me and I don't know if anybody else felt this way, but it definitely made me feel like, all right, like if I was to go back to school, like, you know, they should be privileged to have me there and to have someone um, on that end to be able to represent a group of, of, of people that are um, underrepresented. But I just wanted to share that, um, that aspect from my end. Thank you, Maria, so much. Um, and I completely agree with everything you said. And, you know, you talk about something that's so important, the, especially when, you know, we're so young in that socialization of the validation of education. And, you know, we, we meet success when we go to an Ivy League institution that's predominantly white. Um, and that's so ingrained into our heads. And then it's often once we, you know, graduate from the schools or experience the trauma, you know, that, that we realize, you know, this was not a privilege, you know, this was at the expense of our own mental health and, you know, our just capacity and to just, you know, being present into society. Um, and, you know, I'm grateful for you guys, like just opening a space and sharing the space because, you know, like people have said already, you know, it's us coming together and not um, you, normalizing silence where we can, you know, start to shift the, you know, shift the, you know, the reality for, our future generations. Um, so like Devin was saying before, um, if there's no one else that wants to contribute to this discussion, we're gonna move on to talking about um, racism in clinical social work and you know anything experiences that have come up um, and anything um, our BIPO BIPOC folks want to share with us at this time. Miriam, not to put you on the spot, but you did have your hand raised before. If there's anything you want to um, close out with, please feel free to do so. Um, no, there's a lot that's running through my mind, but thank yeah. you guys all for even giving us the space. We appreciate so much. Um, but I think leaving this call right now, I'm going to leave was like, wow, I'm worth something. And I hope Natasha leaves that because Natasha is just a powerful Black woman. Um, and I think like having each other has like definitely done something, right? Seeing someone who's black that looks like me and seeing people on this call who look like me that are saying like, you don't need this, you don't have to deal with this. And I hope that the little girls who are out there that are growing up, we can be better mentors to them. Um, and this is the work right here, right? Like looking at systems, saying something is wrong and saying, I'm going to dismantle it. So you guys have inspired me and I'm gonna get this degree, y'all gonna see me on TV <laughs> and I'm gonna walk away, but I'm gonna be better and better for the little black girl that's probably thinking that she needs Columbia, Harvard, Yale. I just wanna follow up on what Miriam said. Um, Miriam, I just wanna thank you throughout this whole thing. You have been like, I could not have done any of this without you and without your support and without your motivation. I think a lot of times when we face racism and sexism or whatever else were gaslit a lot mm -hmm. and it's really important to have a person to just support you and provide you with affirmations and to say you know I'm here for you and we're going to work together and that's what Miriam has done for me and that's what you all have done for us today um, I just really really appreciate it and um, 
I'm always so thankful. In Colombia, black faces are far and few in between. Um, and I'm, I'm always really thankful when I can be in a room of black people um, and, and feel that comfort and togetherness. Thank you both so much um, for your bravery, for your advocacy on behalf of Professor Hart, but also for every other black person um, that goes into these institutions, whether they are a professor or a student. Um, and I know you said we did, did a lot for you, but also you did a lot for us opening this discussion and um, just being raw and real and vulnerable with every single one of us. Um, there is power in community and that is what we have created here and that is what we're continuing to create. So we hope to you know, see you guys again. Um, and we know that you will be on TV, <laughs> raising hell, causing trouble, good trouble always. Um, and we're very excited for that. So thank you so much for joining us today and please stay if you can. <laughs> um, yes, I think everyone agrees. Um, shall we move on to our discussion tonight? Um, so our first question, just to open things up, uh, please share if you're willing any personal experiences you've had of racism and or microaggressions within your organization or institution within clinical practice, whether that be as the social worker, as maybe a client or just kind of in the classroom, what you've seen, how things are being taught about clinical practice, what have you. Hi, my name is Keisha and I am from um, upstate New York. And I have two examples, two recent examples. Well, I'm 57 years old, so I have many examples, but um, I have two recent examples um, that just still bother me. So I recently passed my licensure for um, social work um, because prior to getting in the mental health arena, I was primarily working in drug and alcohol. So um, I was focused on my um, KSAC. So once I did um, pass my license, you know, I told my mom and my children and everybody in their respective places. So the next day I tell my supervisor and literally, and I do mean literally, the first words out of his mouth were, did you cheat? And all the black women on here know about the black girl face, <laughs> right? <laughs> I looked at him like, no, you didn't just say that to me. And I said, well, why would you say that? I said, you know, there's no way in hell, and I did use the word hell, that you can cheat. They watch you better than the FBI, the SWAT team, and everybody else. And there were other people that recently had passed their exam. Um, and I said to him, did you say that to so-and-so? Did you say it to so-and-so? You know, I gave names. And he was like, well, you know, I was just joking. Okay, well, that joke went just a little bit too far. And that's what I told him. So I'm a very frank, direct um, individual and I don't believe in um, letting things sit for too long, harboring it. I just, that's just not my, pers my personality. Um, so I really did address him literally right in the moment, like before I even went into my office. And um, he, you know, he never apologized, but he did say maybe twice, you know, I was only joking. And, you know, I said, you need to find a better way to joke because that was, I didn't take that as a joke. And then I went on to say, it seems like to me, you being my direct supervisor, you should have said something like, wow, congratulations, was the exam hard? Did you struggle? Or did, did it come easy? You could have said a plethora of other things, but you said, did I cheat? So the director 
of our clinical program is an African American woman. And I sent an email to her and I included my direct supervisor in it. And I basically said, hey, so-and-so, just want to let you know um, I passed the exam. And, um, and then I said, contrary to my supervisor's name, I did not cheat because I wanted her to know what he had said to me. I tell you. And so I think that has changed my respect for him. You know, um, I don't know. So that's one incident. And then just most recently, um, I work on a crisis team for my city. And um, this is a part-time position. And we have a white male psychologist who is kind of like our clinical overseer, if you will. The program is really, really new, like maybe a month. And there, at the time, there were three black social workers, myself, another black lady and a black young man. And we had like one session with him each. And it got back to the team that he said, we didn't know what we were doing. Now I already forestated that I'm not the one to hold things in. <laughs> so that was brought to our attention like on a Wednesday and then on a Friday, I had my session with him. So we went over a couple of calls that I had. Um, and before we closed out our session, I said to him, you know, I would like to bring something to your attention and kind of get your understanding. My, I want to get understanding of your rationale for, you know, your comment. So when I brought it to his attention, um, he was like, oh, I don't recall saying that. I said, oh, really? <laughs> so I said, you know, I'm not challenging your PhD in psychology, but have you ever been, um, have you ever done any uh, crisis work? Have you ever been on any uh, crisis response calls? Have you ever uh, had to deescalate or do any type of intervention? He was like, no. So I said, whether you said it, whether you said something along the spectrum, you're really not the one to speak to if we know what we're doing or not, because you've never done it, period. And then I said, I felt offended that you being our clinical oversight would even say something remotely similar to that. But of course he denied it and you know, said he don't recall saying it and he was all flustered looking. And in my soul, in my spirit, I believe he, he said that or said something very similar to it. So I just, again, don't even have the respect for him. And we, we really just started working with him. Um, and so I really just don't have the respect for him that I probably could have. Um, I'm, I'm really just in a lot of respects just done with these white men, particularly in white folks um, in general. Um, because they, a lot of times think they're the standard for what's right, what's appropriate, um, you know, just the right way to do everything it is by their standards. So that's all I wanted to say. Um, of course I could go on for the whole session, but I'm gonna let somebody else speak. <laughs> Thank you so much, Keisha. And um, what I'll say is when, when somebody shows you who they are, believe them the first time. Yes, ma'am. So, yes, ma'am. My grandmother taught me very well. Yes. And so we can't forget. 
once they show us who they are. If we mm -hmm. want to, oh, no, they didn't really mean it. When they show you who they are, believe it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you keep that within yourself because you know who you're dealing with then. Yes, yes. And these are the things, unfortunately, that we have to go through on a regular basis mm -hmm. as mm -hmm. BIPOC folks. And so, but I will say right now, congratulations on passing that exam. And you're making your way. Doing what yes. You need to do. Thank so you. Congratulate you. Thank you, Don. Thank you, Keisha, as well. Um, congratulations. Mimi, I see your hand is raised. Would you like to jump in? Hello. Can you guys hear me? Hi, everybody. Um, I, I, first, I want to say I so appreciate these circles um, because most times, you know, you really just have to process it yourself. And sometimes it gets lonely. And two things I wanted to say. One was, like, is there a directory for Black, like, clinical social workers that are able to give clinical supervision? Like that's something that I wish was available, um, like some type of directory that you can reach out in your state, your area um, of, you know, social workers that are that are you know African American or um, social workers of color that you can reach out to, you know, to pro to provide you with supervision. Um, and I say that because of an incident while I'm doing my supervision now, but sometimes. It's like, even in those spaces of doing supervision, like let's say you wanna talk about a microaggression. It's just like, well, my supervisor is white <laughs> and I've been in those spaces. They are, um, white clinicians are not comfortable with having those conversations. Just that raw transparency of me as an African-American um, social worker talking about my experience that I just had with another white clinical social worker and I'm in supervision trying to process that with my white supervisor it doesn't go too well <laughs> and it just makes it really uncomfortable so then it doesn't allow that it doesn't allow for the transparency in supervision that's necessary um as a professional, you know, to be able to have that dialogue and talk about the experience, you know, with your uh, clinical supervisor. The other thing I wanted to tell you, and 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 actually, like I'm processing this myself, so I tried to process it. Like as I matriculated through my master's program, actually on my undergrad, so there was a, uh, a university. Because I'm I'm in New Jersey, so there was a university that I always wanted to go to, very well um, thought of, spoken of, and so I I go to this university, um, not knowing the experience that I was going to have. Because I think that when you go to a social work program, you're under this impression like, oh, we're all loving, we're all coming to this field, you know, we want to help people, empower them, and so I was very naive once I got there, I was like, I was like this, this, I did accounting for 17 years. I have never met more vicious human beings than I did in the social work program. And I work with people that only dealt with money. Like if you would think that type of personality would be anywhere, it would definitely not be in the social work program. So as I began to matriculate, the director was African-American. Um, the assistant director, she was a white woman. And I remember going to, into some of the classes where um, it would be comments like, you know, I feel so I feel so bad for black women, you know, like they're always trying to play catch up. This was in the diversity and oppression class. <laughs> this is the diversity and oppression class being taught by an Italian clinical social worker. And she's making these comments about African-American women. And so I began in the beginning of the program to notice like, okay, this is going, cause I'm very outspoken, especially when it comes to injustice or being inappropriate or unethical. So of course I raised my hand, not knowing how this was going to kind of put me on this trajectory for the rest of my duration of my program here. Because once you speak up, people talk. 
right? So now you have like all the, so you now you're beginning to feel this negative energy. Like she's outspoken. She's, so you feel it, but I'm not, so I'm, I'm, so some of my black colleagues, my peers would be like, Mimi, just leave it alone. Just get through the program. Don't say nothing else. Just leave it alone. But I'm like, no, because how can, how can, this is insane. It's complete insanity that we are in a social work program doing research on vulnerable populations of which I find myself double time, you know, intersectionally because I'm a woman and I'm black and racism is in the social work field and it's unchallenged. That's insane. And so you're teaching us to actually stand up for justice, but just as long as you don't do it in, as you matriculate, do it when you get out there to the organizations, do it in your community, just don't do it in the classroom. So as that begins, so that, so this dynamic begins to shape itself. And so um, one of the white students who was friends with this particular professor and the assistant director, she had said that I chased her. This is, this is a true story. She said, I chased her from the second floor of a building outside of this building. So we had to have this whole meeting with the, um, uh, the, 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 the dean, the president of the university, because I began to send emails. And at that point, I'm a 4.0 GPA student. I worked in the financial, because I told you I did accounting for 17 years. So I worked part-time in this university's financial aid office. So I worked there as a, an employee. So it's not that I'm just a student, I'm also a student and an employee. And so the, the, the most, the crazier part is all of this is going on. And I'm thinking that the, we're in a social work program, not that I wanted the student to be put out of the program, but this is a perfect, op, this is a perfect learning experience for the entire cohort. But instead they swept it underneath the rug, you know, like Mimi, you know, we're going to, you know, uh, discipline the students. So I told them like, you can pull the camera. Like I wanted them to pull the cameras because you should not be able to make this type of statement. And so many times you see this happening. We watched videos of this last year, black people being murdered, you know, white women calling the police, somebody walking their dog. What is the consequence of some, like, it's insane. And so even in that moment, like that was years ago, it probably was like maybe seven years ago that happened. But every time I think about it, or even being, I'm, I'm going to tell white women, especially white women are that are social workers, they are triggers for me. So ever since that situation, I'm like, I don't even, I'm not bothering with it. I don't, I don't even want to engage in it because I have seen a level of viciousness out of, it's just, it's too much. And so here I am, you know, do, you know, now I'm in my clinical part working on my hours and I'm also my doctorate program, you still find the same thing. It's like, if you show up in a space, just being who you are, I'm not trying to be better than no one else, but I'm not going to shrink back and play small either. So when you show up in the fullness of who you are as a human being, you just, you feel the intimidation. And then it's like, here we go with this. It's like this, this, you feel it. And it's tiresome. Like, I swear I cannot say I'm tired enough. And it's like, how, how do you change that? Like, we shouldn't have to go to a HBCU. I should not have to go to a predominantly anything. I should be able to have the right to choose which university I go to. I pay. You, you understand what I'm saying to you? I should be, especially in a social work program, we should be able to go wherever we choose to go and be treated with dignity and respect. And then my thing is, how can these social workers, and then we wonder why the research is the way that it is, because it's like racism is real. And so if you have these, these our colleagues, our peers matriculating through these universities with this type of bias, with this racial attitude towards people of color, now they're going into organizations, now they're working in agencies, now they're becoming clinical supervisors, and now they're just continually perpetuating racism because it's not checked inside of this. If, if people will call it out in the classroom, it wouldn't get as far into supervision. Like you have to call it what it is. You cannot give people degrees that are racist. Yeah. You can't go to people who oppress you to liberate you. 
and Jane Addams was a racist. The feminist movement was baptized in racism. So social work programs are also baptized in racism from the curriculum that you search. So it's because don't be surprised to find out that people who have benefited from racism for 400 years are not giving it up willingly just because they have MSWs or DSWs or PhDs. So no, we shouldn't have to go to a HBCU, but we shouldn't pay to be oppressed. That's, that's what the difference is. And when you look at the curriculum in social work, when you talk about African Americans and it's one chapter, right? Or when you talk about Ida, when you talk about uh, Jane Addams, but you don't learn about Ida B. Wells, you say you sick and tired of being sick and tired. That's what Fannie Lou Hamer said. You're going to mm -hmm. learn about that when you in these communities. And if you're black, you might know about it, but white people are being denied an opportunity to know about and learn about liberated people. So I'm, you can't, we can't as black people expect people to just say, oh, you know, we're, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a thin line between liberals and conservatives, right? I, I sit at the table with liberals who like, who have white friends, who black friends, and I have black friends, and I have black friends, but they're the ones that are creating this bureaucracy. I'm not a feminist, because feminism is baptized in racism. You know, black, you know, Dave Chappelle said white women was in on the on the deal. They just wasn't happy with they cut, you know. So we need to be clear about how oppression is, how it, it perpetuates itself and benefits. I, I guess to me, you know, in, 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 in terms of black people, we have to do due diligence in order to find what we need. We can't go to white people and ask us to help them find black people. Right. There are, you know, there are 74 chapters out here full of black clinicians. They got black girls and social work on Facebook. They got a clinic clinically. I, I get on there so I can hear what the young black girls are talking about and what they're going through. And I was invited here because I really needed to hear this. Somebody said, oh, Miss Melissa, you got to come over here and hear what what's being said and what's going on and what they're talking about, because I don't want you sisters and brothers to believe that you have to suffer and i don't want i don't want you to believe that you gotta beg white people to recognize you now what we do when you go to schools you should ask them just like they ask you what your act score you should ask them what's your black tenure rate you should ask them how many black people graduate from your school in four years we're just so happy to go to these white folks schools we're not asking them questions how long does it take black people to get a, B, a msw from you or a bsw how much does it cost cswe will tell you that it costs black people five times more to get an msw than white people that's what you need to be asking them before you take out a loan to pay them you should make them earn your business and when you find out these schools only got five percent black tenure you think I'm going to go there? You think I'm going to pay for that? No, I'm not. And so what I'm saying is that we have been brainwashed and stereotyped to believe that ice is colder and that we go to them for what we need. Stop begging for what you need. Pay for what you want. You know what I'm saying? That's what the key is. So I, I, I hear y'all pain and it, it just bothers me so to hear y'all suffer in these spaces and y'all don't have to. You don't have to ask white folks for nothing, not a job, not a dollar, not an education or nothing. And if you're doing that and suffering, so this sister, whatever the sister says, she going through trauma going through school. I had a time of my life at, at Clark. Atlanta University. I met some of the powerful, baddest people that you ever want to know. My daddy, when he went to AU, he ran, he walked into Benjamin Mays. Wow, who gets an opportunity to do that? So I'm just saying, I'm saying, I'm, I'm saying don't suffer in silence, but don't keep begging these folks to hear you. Get your liberation and get out of there. Thank you so, so, so much, Melissa. I'm so glad the person that told you to come made you come to this call because you are such a powerhouse. And I don't want to take away from everyone else. And I see there's a lot of raised hands. So, um, Shin Wendu, I see your hand's been raised for a while. So, 
please speak up. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chiwindu. I'm speaking from Minnesota. Um, I just want to kind of relate to what um, Mimi and Isha had said in the beginning, but it's also when going through clinical supervision in my experience from the past as a Black immigrant woman. Um, I may not have all the experience for those who were born here in the state. Have I came in here and then started college of fresh, um, learning all the culture chalk and everything and trying to understand myself in the midst. And one thing I have observed among the African and the black people is that we are passionate towards our work. We show ourselves in our work and we don't take it for granted. But in that line also, I also find it sometimes that we are being underestimated because of the way we speak. Um, as you may, for example, um, walking and coming into an office and talking to a supervisor in the past, um, communicating my, my observations. And when I was giving a recommendation and then I saw the word frustration, I saw the word not um, aggressive. I was like, what? How about changing it into she was passionate? When you're talking to me, like she's passionate about her work. She brings light to people of the population we serve. And coming into a supervision and then you are those person, but when I turn around, it becomes another person, which is not truthful. And also to throw light on when you have reviews and stuff with clinical supervisors and those who supervise you as a black person, reading that, what they are writing about you to understand. I was bold enough, just like you just said, I couldn't hold it down. And I had to walk into the office and was like, I am not gonna sign this document because this did not describe me. This is not my intent when I talk to you of reacting like this towards me, that wasn't okay. So that are the, those are the things that we have experienced that when you're talking, we make a lot of gestures with our hands when you speak, when you're trying to, when you're trying to explain who you are, but in a sense it is taking us a bad, should I say a bad, um, is viewed differently where somebody's using you to learn the DSM-5 to write up some diagnosis and tag you with names and label you with that, which is not appropriate. So these kind of things are the things I'm gonna, like I would say that the clinical ones within the white uh, group should understand how we speak, how the culture plays a lot in our lives, how we learn to uh, be very vocal in our speaking, not that we're trying to uh, come out in a forceful way or address you in a poor way, but we speak the truth. And this is how we feel, not that so, we are frustrated, not that we are arrogant, not that we can't um, defend ourselves. But when you have gone through things that did not define who you are and you're given that name because all that goes up is that leveling, the tag that will follow you along and coming into a place where you feel is a comfort zone and then going out and still experience the same thing is kind of discouraging. So having that clinical black person, we can feel free to talk that understand us is very, very important in this field. And someone who would also be able to stay there and tell us what we need to do, not just suppressing the more. In the field of social work, you're viewed when you work at a hospital and all that, it's like you do not exist until there is a problem, then you become the problem solver. And then when you go in to speak, oh, she was so loud, she was this, she was that, but is when you're not being heard, you want yourself to be heard, you want to be visible. And that is when all those characters come out. So it will be good to address it and also it will encourage the little ones that are coming in into this field in the black community to understand that they have someone they can lean on. They have somebody they can reach out to without being judged. They have someone they can stand and speak their mind in a way that they will not be undergraded. So those things are important. I was going to nursing school before I changed into social work because of my passion in mental health. And that is why I did that. But where you are, somebody is using you to learn, I call it DSM-5, diagnosis in their role. That is really, really painful. It should not be in any way. So I think 
that need to be revisited. The mentorship thing has to be addressed and it has to be introduced at work when people come in. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, Jimondu. And that is actually one of the one of our goals, you know, to really have mentorship, you know, with um, BIPOC and you know our Black students, and to make sure that is something that you know we can get access to. Um, so I see Felix has been next, so you can come on screen. I speak. Hi, sorry, I'm cooking, but. Um, I, I, some of the things that some other people were bringing up really um, connected with me because as a master's student who got um, their BSW and has been kind of in the School of Social Work at my university for a long time, I think I will always continue to educate or advocate really about how our social work schools are like so racist and are perpetuating racism as we graduate racist social workers. My classmates are racist. They don't understand oppression and privilege. We're hiring professors who argue with me about um, oppression and privilege. Um, and so if we're not getting support from our professors and we're not getting support from our classmates and they're just allowed to graduate, um, there's an issue. And I think uh, one of the biggest things I am thinking about recently because I attended the student mental health thingy that was like yesterday. Um, most of the panel were advocating for things like um, self care, that kind of stuff, and talking about this like accepted exploitation of social workers that we just kind of um, think that's that it's okay. Like we're okay with interns being unpaid and doing all of this labor. Um, well, I didn't really appreciate doing unpaid labor for a supervisor who would tell me to my face that she doesn't see color. She only sees people. And then me having to educate is what the issue is here. Marginalized folks have to do extra exploited labor the social work field is full of what we accept, like acceptable exploited labor, long hours, too many clients, and all of these things that we're like not actually breaking down systemically to fix, like not actually addressing. Um, we say self care, but um, you can't tell me as a marginalized person that my extra labor to educate the school will be fixed with self care. Um, when the dean knows who I am when my administration is gaslighting me, like all of these things is uh, really frustrating. And while I appreciate that um, there are some schools that are more progressive than others, mine is not. And I also will never find a school or an institution or anything that looks like me at all. As a queer trans Filipino social worker, I know zero people who, who are that zero. Um, and I think that we really have to think intersectionally about the way that we're addressing these issues. Um, and I'm having a hard time with that. I'm like this close to graduating. I have trans um, and other folks who drop out of school because they just can't handle surviving through school and advocating for their existence within the university. Um, and I think that's really, really an issue. So another thing that I am always going to advocate for is um, like a social justice class as a base class that everybody has to take. We have to take micro practice um, one, two, three, and four. Um, we need to be taking, you know, social justice, advocating, centered in anti-racism. Because when in my micro practice class, we do a privilege walk. And I know for some people that sounds really great, but what a privilege walk is, is for people with privilege to um, have realizations about themselves and their place in society over the, um, the suffering and the oppression of people of color who already know that they're oppressed. When we're sitting back 
in the back of the line in a privileged walk, we know we're not going to be stepping all the way to the to the finish line. But the white people get to sit there and be like, whoa, other people have different <laughs> privileges. They they see different things from me. And if that is the way that we're uh, teaching students to uh, be culturally aware, um, that means that we're using the experiences of our marginalized students um, as examples uh, for only for the benefit of the people who have privilege. So um, I just kind of think that we really need to be reimagining the way that we address um, our allies. And I use that in quotes because uh, white social workers are not my allies um, in, a, in many ways. Um, but it's, it's important to me that we radicalize our education system. And I haven't really been in the field besides in, as an intern, so I can't really speak to that experience. But the, the field that I have experienced is, is hard. Like, I can't go to my white supervisor about my client who's telling me that she's feeling victimized because she says all lives matter and like people are calling her racist. I'm like, you are racist, but I can't say that and I can't tell my supervisor that because she'll tell me, well, is the race issue pertinent to her work as like her development? You know, it's all about that kind of stuff. And it's really complicated and I'm ranting a little bit now, but I wanted to uh, bring that back into the conversation because a lot of people were talking about um, school. And I think that's one of the tangible ways that we can address this situation is by dismantling our institutions and rebuilding them as radical and in my opinion, abolitionist social work entities. Um, but we have to start somewhere. And my experience has been horrible in school, so. Thank you, Felix, so much for sharing your experience, for ranting. You know, this is this is the space for that. So don't apologize for that. We hear you. We see you. We're with you. Um, and you said something so powerful, and I and I don't have it word for word, but you know, your labor is not equivalent to like that self care, um, and you know that that's really important to be cognizant of. Um, and I think we should remember that. Um, so thank you for sharing that. Um, I think Rachel Johnson is next, um, but I don't see you, Rachel. So if you're here, um, please speak up. Um, but if you're not, then, then we'll um, go on to Mara. Okay, so Mara, we'll, we'll go on to you Whose name did you now. just call? Rachel Johnson. Oh, it's me, sorry. Oh. Okay. Brianna, I'll call you back. Okay, sorry about that. Here, let me take my video thing off. All right, so um, I wanted to talk about um, my experience. Um, during the last meeting that you guys had last week, I really, last month, I really felt inspired about it and really bringing um, awareness to students and to professionals and social workers at whole about um, different things that um, minorities are facing. And so I do a podcast, I work in the hospice arena and I picked all people of color cast. And so the owner of the company, he's never actually said anything to me prior to this about anything about my podcast. And he calls, he says, there's a problem. And I go, what is the problem? And he says, well, um, there's only black people on there and you have a Mexican. And I go, what? And this man is of color too. So it was kind of shocking, I would have to say. And I was like, well, I chose to have all color, people of color cast because it's February. He goes, what? Oh yeah, the black people month. And I'm like, okay, all right. How do I even address this? And at this point I'm like physically shaking. And he was like, well, I really feel like you need to get like a white social worker or something like that on and at first I was like so kind of appalled by his behavior and I was thinking okay this is the owner so maybe I should just oblige him and his request and then I called him back and I was like I'm not going to I said I will not add any more guests to my podcast and what I will do if you would like to be a part of it you can 
And it just really kind of shook me to my core because when I, as I was listening to um, the things that were, you guys were, everybody was talking about last month and just understanding like, this isn't just a me thing. Um, and sometimes I think as um, a person of color, cause here I am in Wichita, Kansas, um, there's not a lot of black social workers, you guys um, here in Kansas. So it's like, okay. and. I had to go to a professional um, coach. I, I chose to go to a professional coach because I wanted to figure out how to get more comfortable with that idea. And um, she really did help me with it. I will definitely uh, attest to that, that she helped me find that there is there was a way to actually find privilege in that and to stand out of the crowd. And um, I did admire that perspective, but I just, the idea, I don't know, how to honestly combat a situation where your owner basically says, hey, I don't like that because they're all brown people, especially if he's of color too. Like, I, I just, if you guys have any suggestions, I'm open to that. Hi, um, this is Keisha from Rochester. <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm um, slurping on my smoothie here. I, I would, not on your show, but like at a scheduled time, I would have a conversation with him about your reasoning for highlighting um, people of color during the month of February and just gently remind him that's, designated as Black History Month and maybe just kind of ask some questions around his thoughts and feelings of thinking that's not appropriate like other than he's the owner like what about you doing that is not appealing to him or you know he find it inappropriate or wrong or whatever his words were like like a like a question, like a conversation about it. Okay, thank you. Cause I just was like, I, I had never readdressed the situation. I just kind of avoided it. Cause I was like, I'm not quite sure how to articulate my frustration correctly. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't. Think. And I think another thing as African-American woman and my, uh, my mom is also an immigrant. So I, I definitely understand a lot of the things that um, the ladies were speaking about earlier. Um, I think that you get worried about being labeled as aggressive and it's there's a difference between being aggressive and assertive. Mm -hmm. I'm using assertive behavior when I'm speaking to you frankly, um, but then since I'm African-American, since I'm black, all of a sudden I'm being aggressive and it's not that I'm being aggressive, this is a messed up situation. and. I think you were being completely biased. Mm -hmm. But approach it like I'm just trying to get an understanding of your perspective on what I'm doing for this this month. Like, you know, help me understand, you know, your rationale for whatever it was he said to you. Um, you know, just so I could get a better understanding of your position. That's not aggressive. That's that's just inter you know having a conversation really um you can be aggressive ain't nothing wrong with aggressive on time aggressive and strong is a problem when it go before black women b they had a whole b e a g g r e s s i v e that was one of my favorite cheers when i was going be aggressive as you ever want to be and don't care who don't like it and i would put it in writing I would say I'm unclear about what your concern is with the cast that we're having. Please let me know what that is. Let, he, let him put it in writing because therefore they don't have to worry about your tone or whatever, whatever. This is, my, this is who I selected. I'm unclear. Uh, this is who I selected. Does this work for you? And then if he responds back something ridiculous, then you have it in writing. You don't have to go back and forth with stupid people. That is not a requirement. <laughs> That is not a requirement. That ain't nowhere in the social work diet. And you know, the biggest challenge we have is ignorance. You know, ignorance is the biggest killer uh, in the community. We don't even know that we don't know. But I, I find aggression, a strong, all of that is attractive to me. I don't care who don't like it. That's their problem. 
Thank I you. like the idea of doing it in writing. So there could be a conversation in a written form, but it's still a conversation. And that way, um, that's a good idea. You have it, you know, something to refer back to. You have it in writing, um, you know. But and Rachel, the, Rachel, and if, if, if when you do put it in writing, if he approaches you about it to have the conversation, that's going to be fine. Once you, you guys finish that conversation, go back and regurgitate what was stated in that conversation to him. So that then is in writing as well. Okay. Thank you. Because I was, it was about um, social awareness, um, medical awareness in urban communities and who better to talk about the things that are going on. Or it, it was like a FUBU, like a for us bias situation to me. And I felt like it would be unauthentic for me to utilize people that definitely can't represent these different communities. Um, and if you're an outsider, you're not gonna be able to really reach the people. And I feel like there's already these barriers um, dealing with um, people, uh, white, I mean, people that are not white, I mean, people that are white, I don't even know how to say this, sorry, I'm stumbling around. So when dealing with white social workers, I feel like a lot of the clientele, indigent clients are very apprehensive about being 100. And so um, I just wanted to do something different. And I feel like maybe my location where I, where I live also was against me. Um, so, but I definitely will take what you guys, um, the advice you've given me and I'll go back to the, um, go back and speak with him. Thank you. And Rachel, you know, there sounds like there's some internalized racism within that man. There's some of us who hate ourselves. And so for him to have a problem, you know, you have the conversation, all the, the other recommendations, but again, know what you're dealing with, the self-hate within himself that he's not comfortable with you having other um, Black folks to speak about the issues that you um, developed. So once again, you know, we, we just, we, we just have some issues sometimes that are showing up in different ways. And for him, I, I think because otherwise, why would he have a problem with what you're doing? Thank you. Another thing I was thinking about, um, maybe he might be worried about his funders or who, you know, whoever is dumping money into his, his business, you know, I don't know. I'm just wondering, it, it could be with the- And I've um, thought about that, but here's the thing. There is already a stigma um, in the African-American community dealing with like the idea of hospice. And so- I feel like if there's a message that's from a familiar face opposed to people that you already feel oppressed by, maybe I'd be more likely to want to know more about it because um, a lot of families could be benefiting from this service and they're just not wanting to engage. But I did think, okay, maybe funders are going to they're not going to want to participate or they're not going to like the idea, but I feel like I want to be provocative after listening to the last meeting last month. Like I do supervision for undergrad and graduate students that are getting duly licensed with their social work and addictions counseling license as well. And I really had that conversation and it was polarizing. Um, a lot of my Caucasian students were apprehensive to even engage in the conversation. And I was like, you know, the point of practicum supervision is where we do fumble the ball and we, we engage in these conversations and we learn. And I had um, a Caucasian girl that was still very, very resistant to even engage. And it almost took coercing to get her to even speak up. And that's some of the things that bother me because you're wanting to work with, you're wanting to go work in substance abuse. So you're going to deal with a diverse culture and you're not willing to talk about issues that are going on. And so how is that gonna, if this is bothering me as like your supervisor, how are you gonna treat your students? I mean, not your students, your, um, your clients. 
Hey, Rachel, don't don't assume. I think sometimes we get in, we have this idea and we assume that all black people are awake. We have been conditioned and sucked into the lies to ignore the racism, the level of racism and oppression. Um, and so take this as an opportunity to wake him up, to educate him. Um, you, I mean, you have this knowledge, you know this population and shame on him for not knowing, but don't shame him, educate him and see where he's coming from. And then if he doesn't say, if he doesn't wake up, then you do have a problem. And he does have a problem. And I agree with Dawn, he will have, he, he would have a problem once you give him that, that information. Sometimes it's just easier for our folks to say, I'm just gonna keep it moving and stay on the back of the bus because they feel safe. Thank you. Rachel, thank you for sharing. And uh, Professor Collins, you're very popular. So thank you for also speaking up and giving your piece. Um, Mara, uh, your hand has been raised for a while. So would you like to speak? Yes, hi, uh, my name is pronounced Mara too. Um, so thank you. Um, so yeah, this kind of goes back. I, I really appreciate what we've been talking about tonight and thanks for having this space for us. I've, I've had that experience with the fact that our schools graduate racist social workers. Um, you know, I was in a class in my undergrad where we talked about privilege and this um, male student refused to get white male student just refused to to take the lesson and you know, there were it took the entire class to argue with and to try and educate and at some point the teacher just kind of gave in and other students that were like well I know him and he's a good guy gave in it's like no we're, we're telling you that your thought of wine is racist and that the fact that you can't accept privilege is an issue um, and that person went on to graduate went on to get licenses working and something that sticks with me that I'll never forget is after we left that class, other colleagues came up and said, and because I was one of the people that spoke up, because a lot of us do speak up in that class. And guess what? They still get it, still get that degree, they still graduate them. And someone looked at me in my eyes after that class and said, It's crazy, you know, because one day he's going to be your supervisor. And um, that was just disgusting that we'd normalize that someone with that idea and that mindset can't learn anything from our social work programs and they will still graduate racist and we accept that. And then another time in my MSW program, I read a case study that was utterly racist. It was about a black mother who had friends and she was on crack and she couldn't take care of her kids. And I was like, why are we reading this? Why is this what is this? And then there was even a part where you had to talk about cultural competency. And it's like, okay, you've written this abhorrently racist case study. You made us read it. And now you're making us like act like this is our client. And it was, there were certain descriptors in there that just did not need to be there. It was racist. It wasn't that, oh, this client just happens to be African-American. No, it was it, it was a racist case study and we were still made to just accept that and to act like that was normal. And, oh yeah, this could be one of your clients. And on top of all of that, even outside of our schools in supervision um, last year, um, when I was an intern, we had a big group supervision and we were talking about cultural competency. And we took this tool um, that talked about um, you know, how black are you or some other kind of level of privilege that you may have. And I remember reading this tool and thinking this is racist. Um, it had a lot of stereotypes on it about how like black people are poor and must have guns in the house, like drugs. It was ridiculous. And so I called that out in this division. I said, hey, why are we using this tool here? It, it's racist, it is. Um, and I, will I won't forget this either, the person who had come in to lead our supervision, it wasn't our supervisors, it was someone else who had come in to lead that supervision for us, said, 
well, sometimes you just have to work with what we have and this tool is really good. And, um, you know, like started to make excuses for why this tool was racist. And I said, why are we even using this? Why are we using something outdated? If you don't agree with this tool and you say that, yeah, it has issues, why are we using it? Why are you using this as a teaching mechanism in our supervision about cultural competency? Why are we talking about stereotypes when it comes to talking about black people? And it, it, it's hard because even in all of those situations, everyone I've talked about, I've spoken up, like I've said, hey, this is racist. Hey, I have a problem with this. Hey, that's not right. And nothing changes. Like that person is still, he supervises people where he works. He came in and supervised a whole group of like 15 of us in my supervision group. And even at my school, they graduated someone who was racist and who was willing to be racist right there in class and was not willing to change their mind, was not willing to grow, learn, or change. And it's hard. It is tiring when everyone on here talks about being tired, being exhausted. I felt that and I still feel that. And even being young in the field, it's it's hard. It hard. It's hard. It feels like an uphill battle being a black social worker and that you have to work twice as hard to prove your worth and to prove that you are in you are just as good as these other social workers and you know I, I always feel that that we're always working twice as hard to get pretty much no support into um like you said pay to honestly have racist educations and to endure microaggression after microaggression in every part of the field whether it's at whether we're in school we're getting supervised we're at our clinical practice we're at our we get racism from clients even and it's just it's disheartening it's disgusting so it's it's just hard to have to go through this but it is nice to have this space where i can feel like i'm not alone in that and that this is unfortunately what's normal for us to to live with Well, I want to say it before we get to the next person um, is that if you look at K-12 education, if you look at the mental health and not even looking at many of the systems that exist that are, are racist, um, these professions have become a cash cow for folks. By cash cow, I mean they're getting their tenure, they're getting, um, they're making good money they're moving along, but they have no vested interest in BIPOC people. They're not concerned as it pertains to BIPOC people, being able to, the kids graduating from school, encouraging them, seeing their greatness within, instead of putting them down. So we have to recognize that we are in the midst of all these systems that are racist, that our kids are being filtered through these systems. And these systems are not concerned with our, especially I'm talking about the kids because that's my heart. Those are my babies. And they care nothing about our BIPOC children. And so when we're working with especially BIPOC children, we have to give them extra love and care. And I think Felix said that, and that's what made me think about the cash cow. just recognizing how, whether it's federal grants and all these, the monies and grants that these agencies are getting. And one day I just started thinking, what's going on in the communities? I've been in this community for years. Why hasn't there been a shift in regard to what's going on here? How can someone be at a community meeting and say, oh, we've been trying to do this for nine years. We just can't connect with the folks and still have their job. It, it's just an abomination on so many levels. But we have to really plan. We're planning. Um, Sam's doing the planning, gathering the data. But when you start really thinking about what needs to be done, you're talking about BIPOC folks coming together, really planning and starting to organize, applying for grants and doing the things that maybe some of us 
said we wanted to do when we came into this field, field, but now we're caught up with the agencies and the places that we do work. We have to make our own for our own people and that's what it comes down to. That's what it comes down to. The sugar honey iced tea is not getting any better. I just wanted to say, Dawn, it's a responsibility for all of us who are at the LCSWC level. And if we are teaching at universities, whether it's a HBCU or a, you know, a PWI, we have a individual, we have a responsibility to ensure that our students are awake, that we are educating our students about the history, including the history of this country and how child welfare agencies and juvenile justice agencies were, uh, were, were founded and that it, the, they're not these benevolent agencies that were started uh, and they excluded, excluded African-American children. Um, and we, so we have to take some responsibility to make sure we are waking up these, our, our, our students because that's the, they're, they're the change agents that are coming. You know, I talk to my students about there are 700, over 700,000 social workers in the United States and 339,000 of those work in either some type of child welfare agency or school. Well, guess what? We got prison to school pipeline and we got African-American children um, and, and Hispanic children overrepresented in child welfare. Guess why? Because we're what we're talking about today because the level of racism that is perpetuated in those agencies, but it still comes from the schools and the schools aren't teaching these students, the history of this country and the oppression of this country. So we we have to wait. We have to take a, our opportunity to wake up our our students. I don't know how many of you saw the 100 years of social work, and how many BIPOC folks were in that video. That was about two hours long. Probably if a handful of folks. So these are the types of things that we have to do. I, I, I was just like, where, where are, there are black social workers. Why aren't they in this video? Because like you were saying, Terry, we have to, we have to make our own. There are, are black social workers, Latino social workers. There are um, Native American social workers but we're just floating in the wind without any type of regard. So again, bump that. What do we need to do? What we need to do, Sam? <laughs> make it happen. Let's make it happen, you know? And uh, enough of us have gotten these degrees and stuff. They've gotten enough of our money that we can make this happen. Write, writing curriculum, starting to, sorry, writing the curriculum and doing the things that we know need to be done and just to educate this next group of social workers coming up. Just don't feel defeated, please. There's work to be done and we're going to incrementally start getting some things done. Don't feel defeated. If our ancestors felt defeated, we wouldn't be sitting right here right now. So we, we just gotta keep on keeping on. Um, Jamila, I see your hand is raised. Would you like to speak up? Um, well, yeah, um, can you, everybody hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm listening to everybody and it's funny how when you think you're going through stuff alone and it's good to realize that you're not. That's a good start. I'm in uh, addiction services. I say services because like somebody said now, it's just big business. 
And like I had said earlier in the comments, I grew up in foster care because at that time I'm a 70s baby. And if anybody can remember, crack hit my community very hard. And it's hard to be in this field, especially in the meetings talking and uh, the cause your Caucasian coworkers suddenly these big professionals when I remember when they just said, just say no. Now it's this big, oh, it's a crisis, it's a disease, we have to do this, uh, do this. But I remember my family getting torn apart, dad thrown in jail, moms, us taken away. And I had to take a cultural competence class because a, so, a supervisor felt that maybe my past might cause me to be judgmental with white clients. But I've had coworkers who I've known to be real racist towards African-American clients, any minority client. And it's crazy to me. And it, it, it kind of turned me away from something I wanted to do all my life because of my experience. I always wanted to be a social worker and help. And now I hate it. So instead of being miserable, like Ms. Colin said, I decided to do something about it. I decided to just spread out, stop being scared, get out the box and go try to do something on my own. So I just had an interview for a grant and I'm hoping I get it so I can start a women's group in my community for self-care. We walk around with so much anger because we have so much trauma and everything that is just compounding on and on and on. And what I like about the young generation now is they're not scared, they're fighting back. But this movement is a movement. It's not just something that's just gonna go away. So I'm feeling kind of good. I'm feeling kind of good because when I was young, I'm in my forties now, they didn't have meetings like this. They didn't have outlets. So the only way I could release was anger. And then what that does is like people say, well, they go to angry black women. So I'm happy to have this platform, I'm happy to share, I'm happy to get to network with other people and ideas that I could bring to my community when I start my own thing. Cause I shouldn't let somebody else views on me take my passion away and what I could contribute to my community. I'm not gonna do it anymore. I'm frustrated, I'm angry, but instead of just complaining now, I'm just gonna do something about it. And the generation that's behind me, I want them to see me doing it. I live in the projects. I'm a product of my community, but I don't have to be a statistic anymore because people saying that where I come from. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Jamal, for sharing that and for being here with us today. Um, I'm glad also that you are taking your experience and fueling that into like right back into your community and not instead of letting it kind of push you away and just say well i'm just not going to do this work um, because it's not about them it's about the people that we serve at the end of the day and so i really wish you the best with your grant and i you know i think we all could speak for all of us that we really hope <laughs> that you get it and you can continue to do the work that you were meant to do um, thank you for that thank you So we have Jason next, and I just want, um, we're at eight o'clock, so we're already half an hour after the time that we've said, but that's okay. We want to hear everyone that has their hands raised. So we'll still be going on. Um, if you can stay with us, please stay with us, um, and um, we'll just continue the dialogue. Um, so Jason. Thank you very much. I uh, want to thank you all for hosting this event this evening. Uh, it has been very uh, exciting and very heartening to listen to the contributions that have been made tonight. Uh, so often in my work, I've been working in uh, human resources most of the time uh, and sort of dibbing, dibbing and dabbling or so to speak, dibbling and dabbling in uh, law and social work in the evening. Uh, and uh, so this is like, a really good chance to sort of connect back uh, to my social work roots. Uh, so it, it is very refreshing. And I just wanna thank everyone uh, for the contributions. 
I did want to say on the heels of what's just been mentioned by the previous speaker, one of the things that I attempted to do in the evening, sort of after doing the work that pays the bills, right, is to also begin to network uh, with social workers, right, because I think that opportunities like this are as much about gaining new learnings and having uh, and sharing knowledge amongst ourselves as much as it is about networking amongst ourselves. I mean, I just find that as a social worker, being someone who uh, is in the law field, being someone who's in the HR field, the one area of my life professionally where I feel like I don't get a chance to network as much is in the field of social work. And so I just wanted to put it out there that, uh, you know, I've decided to start my own thing. Uh, I welcome you all to connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, I am now the founder and president of the American College of Mental Health Education. I am a black man. I bring, I bring a black perspective uh, to the work that we do around continuing education and social work examination preparation. Uh, and that's why I, I do that work. It's a labor of love. Sometimes there are two people, sometimes there are three people, right? Uh, in the class, and it really doesn't matter to me. The most important thing is that I'm helping people to renew their licenses and uh, get past the clinical uh, examination. Uh, and so invite you all to connect with me on LinkedIn. A couple of people have already done so, so I'm looking forward uh, to sharing different things with you. I really think that that's important, right? It's not necessarily about what I started per se, but it's about starting the conversation, starting the connectivity, between ourselves as professionals, I think that that's so important. So just wanted to get a chance to say that this evening. Thank you, Jason. Congratulations. Um, and if you want, and I don't know if you've done it already, but please feel free to put in your LinkedIn and anyone else that wants to put in their LinkedIn or social media, please do. This is the space um, for it. Um, and this is also why we're here to connect with each other and just to keep the movement and the relationships going on between these month monthly town halls. Um, so Stephanie, um, I have you next. So if you'd like to share. Thank you, sorry, I was trying to find the unmute button. Um, one of the things that I, um, on a clinical side, wanted to bring to the table was the personal experience of trying to find um, counseling, um, not only for myself as a social worker to have someone to speak to, um, but also even for my children who go to a predominantly white school um, to where they daily have to go through microaggressions um, in order to get them this private education so that we can do what we feel is the American way to progress in this world. I feel like I've done a damage to them and I'm working on getting them out of that situation. Um, but when I need to find counseling, there is no one that looks like me in my rural community. And within the schools, we're not teaching people true cultural diversity because we're allowing people to kind of put down the cookie cutter answers um, while they're in, in college. But then when they're out here in the field, they're right back to their, you know, linear minded idealism. And so when I go in to speak to somebody, their first thing is I can prescribe something for you. Not saying culturally, what have you been through? What traumas do you go through every day? You know, not to have that looked at um, is damaging within the profession and within our community. Um, so that's what I, you know, come to these meetings to find out how we can change it. And it sounds like it has to be changed at our university. And because we are allowing people to come out into this world within the social work profession to continue to traumatize and damage the people that we serve. And it has to stop. And that's all I wanted to say. Thank you, Stephanie, for that. Um, I have Joanna next. Um, 
Good evening, everyone. Thank you so much for the opportunity of um, sharing with everyone who is um, participating in this in this meeting. I just um, basically wanted to share with everyone the groundwater approach. Um, it, it is um, a training that I was recently introduced to. Um, it is it is being held by the uh, racial racial equity institute, and um, it was really really um, helpful to understand um, structural racism, how um, racial inequity um, looks the same across different systems, um, how it is not tied uh, to socioeconomic differences, which is what we have all been made uh, to believe, right? It's, it's one of the things that we have been made to believe. And um, it absolutely establishes that inequities through the systems are caused by systems, regardless of people's cultures and people's behaviors. So I really think this is a training that all social workers should, should um, take. Um, I think that corporations should, should be trained on this. And what, what calls my, my attention about, about it is that the uh, Racial Equity Institute is an alliance of uh, different um, organizations uh, in, in our government who are understanding of the fact uh, of structural racism. And they have a very specific plan that social workers can actually implement and they can join uh, forces to actually start um, confronting st structural ra racism in the same way that it was made structurally. So I just uh, wanted to, to add that contribution right before joining here. Um, I, I was curious about Hawaii uh, because someone asked the question about it. And, and um, when I actually typed in the point in time count of the homeless in Oahu, uh, and I came across the data, um, I was just, uh, I was shocked. I was angry when I realized that the um, racial disparity of nation uh, of native Hawaiians in, are that are over represented in the homeless population in their own land by they're over represented by 210 percent when you compare them with their white counterparts that are under represented by 24 percent you know in their own land so again a for-profit housing market um, that is established by, by the same structure structures that are led by the white man. Um, and we see those inequities all across the different systems, housing, health, so on and so forth. But uh, please go take, take a minute uh, and I promise you will not regret uh, learning a little bit and introducing your organizations to the groundwater approach. Thank you so much. Have a great evening. Thank you, Joanna. And that was the groundwater approach. Um, and Joanna, if you have a link to the training or something like that, um, if you could put it in the chat for folks. Okay, I'd absolutely. Appreciate it. I, I, will, I will absolutely do that. And if you, um, you know, if you go to Google and you type the groundwater approach, it will come up and, um, so, but I will definitely share Great. with everyone. All right, bye everyone. Have a good day. Great. Bye, a good evening. Thank you. I don't see any hands raised right now, but if anyone would like to contribute, please do jump in. Notion. Hi everyone. Um, first, I want to thank everyone um, for all the stories and the valuable like gems that were dropped. Um, and I actually wanted to go back uh, to Felix and a lot of what the other students were saying about the problems within social work institutions and the curriculums. Um, and I do wanna say, I don't identify the clinical social worker. I will run away from that as quickly as possible. Um, I do prefer policy and macro social work. Um, but one of the things that I remember from my BSW program and in taking a lot of the clinical classes because we were mandated to was learning about cultural competency and then being recognizing that I was the only Asian, South Asian or East Asian, I was the only Asian person in the class, the only Muslim person in the class, um, and the only person that practices wearing the hijab in the class as well. 
Um, and then them teaching about cultural competency and then treating Asians as monoliths. And under like, and I always understood that people, a lot of people lack the understanding that Asians are very, 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 very different, incredibly different. Um, and then also me being tokenized in the class and then people take relying on my experiences as a daughter of an immigrant, as an Asian um, and as a Muslim to inform how they would practice in the communities when they do become social workers. And me having to sit with the fact that these people are going to be so incompetent when it comes to working with these communities because they don't understand the fact that you shouldn't tokenize people um, and that you should take it upon yourself to learn how to work with those communities. And if you can't, don't you dare work in those communities because you will just be re-traumatizing them. Um, but for me to sit in that class and have to deal with the fact that these people will be going into these places and re-traumatizing them and how our curriculum fails to actually educate and prepare social workers to do what we ideally want to do in our profession. Um, and I know that we have a lot of professors and students in this class, and I want to say for all the students who have felt that way, you're not alone. I felt that way too. And I know a lot of other BIPOC social workers who probably have constantly felt that way too. Um, and to anyone who has the power, you know, like as a professor in administration, especially for anyone who is white, put yourself in the front line and take that hit because your position will not be at risk like our positions will be. And to take that and force your administration to change. And if you are white, I like I ask you, you know, like be at the front line and do that work first. Thank you. Thank you so much, Notion, for your ask, for you know your initiation to the ED, for just starting these conversations. Um, you know, it, it's been a revol like a revolution. So thank you. Um, so we are going to start to close out now. Um, it's eight fifteen. If people don't have any other contributions, um, I'm going to hand it off to Devin and Don to you know give um, you know a little bit of their piece, but. Thank you guys for joining us so much tonight. Thank you for everyone that contributed both in the chat, both you know on video, on audio. Um, this is such a special place because of what you guys make it, the experiences you share, um, and it's only gonna get stronger. Um, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Go ahead, Dom. I'd like to thank all of you for coming today, um, this evening. Once again, just powerful sharing conversations. Um, I want to encourage you all to do, um, as people of color in this world, the journey isn't easy, but just stay together with some other um, BIPOC folks who you can talk to. Mm -hmm. um, Make sure that you go for your own mental health. Do what you need to do today. Stay um, sound mentally. Um, laugh in the midst of the madness. So be around somebody who can make you laugh. Listen to a corny joke or something like that or dance silly. You know, life is serious. There's so much going on. And we're just talking about ourselves. We're not talking about being concerned about our family members, you know, having, I have black sons, every time they drive their car, they go out. So I just stay with a knot in my stomach 24 seven, because you just don't know what's going to happen. But the, at the same time, I know that um, my ancestors didn't give up. Some died trying and fighting and I feel committed to do the same, whatever I can do. And so I leave that word of encouragement to all of you. Keep on keeping on, stay strong, stay around people who will help to lift you up when your spirits go down. And um, you're not alone. This journey is no joke in the skin, I always say. It is no joke, but we too can get through especially with us supporting one another. 
So again, thank you so much for coming. And I'll see you at the next one. You take care. Devin, did you want to say anything? Yeah, I mean, Don really said all the words, <laughs> all the words that we needed. Um, but I do want to thank everyone again for being here with us tonight, for trusting us with your stories, with your experiences, and for um, healing with us as well. This is an incredibly healing space, um, even though it's difficult to talk about. And there's a lot of anxiety and emotions that come up every time we have these discussions. Um, but I myself leave and the rest of you, we always hear leave feeling very, very empowered. And so thank you for sharing space with us um, and just doing this work with us every single month. Uh, this is going to be a lifelong journey, unfortunately, but um, thank you for being here and continuing the fight. Thank you to all the facilitators. Thank you to Notion. Thank you to our students at Columbia. Uh, thank you to Melissa for coming in from National Association of Black Social Workers. Uh, thank you to all of you. And I hope you join us in March. Uh, we're gonna be here March 23rd at six o'clock. And don't forget, uh, if you want to volunteer to be lead one of our BIPOC work groups on the schools of social work, uh, you don't have to be a member, members, non-members, doesn't matter, social workers, wherever you're from. Uh, if you're BIPOC, you want to leave, let us know. Uh, we're going to be meeting on the 8th to do a training. Our next, uh, our next topic is going to be policy and macro social work. But as you know from, from this one, it's very fluid. <laughs> we, we end up talking about school of social work and clinical too. So we're very happy to have you. I hope you have a good night. Thank you for joining us. And uh, we hope to see you back here in a month. Good night. Bye. Bye.